Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. So in this video, we've got an exciting one. It is going to be our first track day for the Camaro ZL1 Wena Lee. And we have to get Erin a helmet because she's gonna be a passenger for the first time. She's never done that before. And we'll- I did it, what was it? Cross the, um, I'm having a stroke. I have no idea. Autocross? You, autocross. That doesn't count. I this is a track day. This is friend. a first real track. Yeah. yeah, so you didn't even ride with me. So where are we going? Jigs. No, for the track day. Nelson's Ledges. Nelson's Ledges is where I first got my racing license. It's where I first got on a track. It's where um, I had my first race. Everything about it, Nelson's Ledges is where I grew up and where I did everything first with. But that was for a motorcycle, so now we're gonna go there for a car. Uh, I've never been there with a car, uh, but I've been to many other tracks, and again, this is just gonna be the first time in the Camaro uh, with her riding shotgun. I tried to get her to do the novice group and even take the car out, but she said no for at least this time. Just but, for financial reasons. Is that the reason? Yes, we just had a sick cat that I had to pay like $1,300 for, so let me pay that off right quick. And then I'll race your car. <laughs> Whatever. You're not definitely not racing in a novice group. Novice, so the, usually you, there's three. you think I'm better than that? No. You don't think I'm better than that? Usually there's three groups. There's novice where you go out, basically just follow the leader. You're going slow as can be. You're just learning where the track line is or the race line. And then by the end of the day, they let you speed it up a little bit, but there's really no passing. Um, on the straightaways, yeah, you can pretty much punch it, but it uh, just depends on the traffic and who's around you. Then you've got the intermediary group that uh, it's kind of in between that. There's still like no passing in the morning usually, um, as opposed to the advanced group where it's just kind of balls to the wall. You go the whole time and do what you're going to do. Um, and passing is allowed, but still only with like the go ahead. Uh, you can't just pass someone who thinks they're, you know, focused on the line and say they're on the straightaway and you may only be in a 400 horsepower car and then here goes a thousand horsepower power car scaring the crap out of you so even in the advanced group you still have to look in your mirrors and wave the faster cars by or if a corner worker sees someone coming up on you and they know you're faster they will blue flag you and you need to look and be like oh okay yeah yeah go ahead so um i actually signed up for the intermediary group even though i've done many days with advanced i actually have my racing license for motorcycles um you're rusty Maybe, but I've also never taken out a 650 horsepower and 650 torque car before. So I would rather spend half the day learning the car and Nelson's Ledges since uh, last track I've been at with a 370Z was mid-Ohio. So I would rather learn without having to worry about everyone else around me until the end of the day and then like I said intermediary group usually get to step it up and kind of do what the advanced group's doing but uh I don't think you'll have as ballsy people around you um as you do in an advanced group and I have put myself in that situation before where I went advanced had my racing license first time ever at mid Ohio and 1,000 cc bikes were blowing by me and way late braking more than me, like down the front straightaway. And it took like two or three sessions for me to get up to where I was skill level wise at other tracks. But first time on a track, having those faster riders around you, it's intimidating. So I don't want that to happen with the car. So we'll sign up for that. Again, you get to ride passenger, but she's got to get a helmet. And then we got to figure out if we are going to leave everything stock with the safety hardware, like seat belts and stuff like that. I don't think uh, it's two weeks away. So you guys will be back with us in two weeks after today. Um, hopefully it's not raining. Hopefully we can get track daytime in and we'll see what happens because it's going to be April 30th, I think I told you. So we may still be in spring showers. So we'll we'll just have to wait and see. But when we get back home from getting air in a helmet, uh, there's one thing I gotta show you on the car, and it's very disappointing. Fingers crossed it works out, but I'll show you when we get back. All right. So Aaron found a helmet, but real quick, I did want to mention. I am gonna switch out that AC Delco oil because Redline does make a 75 weight 90 and a GL5. 
category, whatever that is. And then it does have the friction modifiers in it. So Redline says this is for my car on their website. Um, if Chevy has anything to say, if I blow up a rear differential, well then Chevy can fight it out with Redline or Redline's gonna be paying for my differential because it has everything that I need for the differential. I just know that this is not that expensive over the AC Delco or actually I might have even paid more for the AC Delco uh, like a month ago when I bought it. I wanna say it was like $23 a bottle and this is only $18. So to go with a much better synthetic oil, um, much better base stock and to have everything in it that I need this is gonna work probably just fine for us and then I also just picked up two more of those straps that actually have the locking hooks so when we tow the car uh, to the track I just think they're a hell of a lot better to where that piece right there actually locks down as opposed to the ones that just kind of have like the claw foot if those let go or break or something um, these just hold better not to mention they're almost 2,000 pounds more that they can hold so Upgrading that and that, and then try it on. It's nothing special, but it is a car helmet, so there is a difference. Most organizations will not let you run uh, a motorcycle helmet because I can't remember the different classifications on the difference between a motorcycle and a, a car, but this one, for example, is Snell SA 2020. Uh, I can't remember what motorcycles come in, but it, it's a different type of Snell rating, I think, or it's something different altogether. But at least it's the 2020 model, so brand new for the classifications. I think mine might actually be a 15 or a 10, so it's a little bit older. But they do still do allow that uh, for now, at least, I think. What? Say it. What? You look like Lewis Hamilton. Do you? Good luck with that. Do I drive that way? You apparently couldn't even handle two laps. And then they say your neck completely gives out. Oh, on an F1 track. I thought you Correct. went where we're, to Nelson's Ledges. No, on an F1 car. I saw a video saying some guy said he was driving an F1 car and stepped on the brake pedal. He said as hard as humanly possible as he could as he was getting like his three laps in that they allow you. And then he got back to the pits and the data recorder said he could only push down on the brake pedal about 60%. So apparently you have to be ungodly human to be able to brake an F1 car, uh, not throw your neck out from the G-force when you actually do hit it somewhat and within a couple turns the g-forces are so great basically your neck muscles give out and then you just can't hold your head up in an f1 car so you have to have severe training so i just need one person to give me a chance for what to, to prove yourself <laughs> in an f1 car yeah. good luck okay good luck with that all right, so let's get home. Let me show you guys the bad news. And then I think the next time you guys will see us is when uh, we're actually at Nelson's Ledges and we're racing. All right, everybody, so back home and I did have to get some shut eye. I worked all last night, but uh, time for the bad news. And I swear, I think I jinxed myself because in a few videos ago, I was doing some maintenance and stuff. And one of the things I did is Erin had a screw or nail in her tire and uh, I had to repair it. And what I just did was pull the screw out, um, ream the hole out and put in one of those tire plugs from the outside that kind of gets glued in. And wouldn't you know it, uh, I said in that video that I usually use those external plugs. They seem to work well for an everyday car. But if I had a nail in a track tire or something, I said that I would go ahead and replace the whole tire or take it to a repair shop and actually have them do it internally with a whole big plug that gets glued in from the inside out and do it properly. Well, wouldn't you know it, I found a freaking something, I don't know what it is yet, in this tire at 400 miles. And now we're just under 700, I think, and the car's been sitting for at least a week or more because the weather has been just so freaking bad. But yeah. There is something in the tire. I'm gonna go in here and uh, fire up the infotainment and see if maybe it's still holding pressure 
because for the week or so, or you know, from 400 miles to 600 miles or 700, whatever, I noticed that the tire pressure gauge still said that it was full of air. And in fact, that tire back there, the passenger rear said, it's like one to three PSI lower than all the others. So I don't know if the sensors are wrong or if that one's not leaking, it just happens to be one to three PSI lower than the other ones. But it'll be interesting to see for sitting in the garage for a week or more now, if the tire pressure is actually low or not. But, uh, oh my God, that sucks so bad. 400 miles and we already picked up something. It's a round head. I don't want to start the car. So fire it up, I guess. And holy crap. I don't think I mentioned this in the last video with the exhaust, but for this thing to be this loud, it doesn't show on camera, but when you actually fire it up, This thing maybe is something like a tack and it just didn't pierce low enough into uh, the actual inside of the tire to where it's actually leaking air. I can't see it right now, so I gotta back up and then see if we can find it. And there it is. So it definitely looks like a nail, but I don't know. I just think it's weird that it's not leaking at all. Now it isn't a good spot that a repair would be okay, so I believe. But uh, uh, I don't know, should I leave it? Should I pull it? It's not leaking, but we are going to a track day. So what to do? I just can't believe that it's not leaking. So that's just weird if it is a nail and it actually is, is going all the way through. But it probably won't be a bad idea to at least pull it because if it is a super long nail, every time we hit a bump, these tires only have like a 30 profile. So if that nail's super long, every time we hit a bump, that nail head could be hitting the back of the rim on the inside, which that wouldn't be a good thing uh, if we just keep like hitting metal on metal and uh, maybe weakening the rim or something. So I think we need to get uh, some soap. I think we need to uh, pull it out and uh, fingers crossed it's really super short, but uh, just kind of go by there, see what happens. And if it is a bad hole where it starts to profusely leak right now, we can do an external plug. And then I think we just have to take it to a shop and have them do an internal plug. Like I said, I usually will replace a tire, especially on a track car, especially a 4,000 pound car that's gonna be doing like 160 miles on the straightaway. But uh, I think enough people have good luck with uh, plugs that uh, there won't be a failure as long as the plug is on the inside of the tire. And again, it's right dead set in the middle, so it's not like it's gonna like blow out from the side. So I don't know, let's get some soap or something. Let's get a pair of pliers and let's see if we can dig this thing out. Hmm, interesting. So I don't hear any leaking and that's what it was. It looks like a nail, but it looks like it was broken off and maybe I just picked it up somehow. So I find that very hard to believe that that didn't go all the way through uh, the amount of rubber that's on that tire. I don't know how thick that is, but I mean, that's over a quarter of an inch. That's at least three eighths of an inch, damn near a half of an inch thick. So for that not to go all the way through, I find that very, very hard to believe. But uh, I can't tell if that could be a nail possibly from around the house or if I just picked it up on the street. Uh, I think that's impossible to tell. But holy crap, uh, I don't know. I'm afraid if I don't put something back in there, then that weak rubber may want to separate and then eventually leak out or pop or something. Or on the other hand, uh, if I go ahead and put a plug in it now, then I'm actually drilling a hole into my rubber and uh, then weakening, weakening it, even though a plug would follow. So, <laughs> oh crap, decisions, decisions, what do I do? 
Well, I think for starters, we'll uh, get a, a little spray bottle of soap and spray it on there. And I might chalk the outside of the tire over here so that way I know where that hole is in case the rubber kind of melts and goes back into place or something. But uh, yeah, how about we chalk it? Let's uh, get some soap and water, keep an eye on it. Uh, it's a nice day right now, it's kind of cold, but uh, we need to get some miles on the car. So Chevy doesn't want you going on the track until you have at least 1,500 miles. So the fact that we're only at about 700, uh, we still got some miles to put onto this thing before we can change out the brake fluid, uh, do the oil change with the racing brake fluid or the uh, racing oil, and uh, go ahead and put in the red line diff fluid. And then at 1,500 miles, right before the first track day, we'll be able to knock all that out and then we'll be freaking ready. So. Uh, let's get Aaron. Let's go out for kind of a nice drive today. I think it's Saturday or Sunday and uh, I don't know. Fingers crossed. Let's see what happens. You haven't heard this in person cold start, have you? Nope. Except for in the RV. Right? Yeah, when I was inside and you were out here. I don't even think that's cold. It was started up like 15 minutes ago. Yeah. Well, I still have 38 PSI after the nails pulled, so. That was fine. We'll find out. I almost want to venture a guess and say that I pretty much killed my brake pads on that braking procedure after just that many hard braking. That's really going to suck to have to replace the pads. After every track day or what? I don't know. I gotta find out what the average is for the factory ones. Because that seems like an awful... Yeah. I don't know. Granted, Nelson's Ledges is very, very, very fast. Uh, not that much braking, except for uh, like kind of on the back straightaway. I don't know. I guess we'll find out pretty quick. Oh look, a highway. shorts and new balances I can't tell is the thing they're in the car revving it through parking lots like I've seen several today I don't know if I got the purples though well they did this is going to be a handful on the track I've seen videos most guys on the track will literally drive just like this the whole time that like, they fun. cannot they cannot control. I mean, they are controlling, but it's like dangerously controlled. Just everything is what twitching. What do you think the AMG would have been like? I don't know. Nice. Better, maybe. I don't know. This is a good on ramp. So we got two days before the track day and right now we need to go ahead and bleed the brakes with racing fluid. I think I'm going to get a few hundred more miles in tomorrow because right now I think I'm a little over 1300 so I'm almost at the 1500. So tomorrow we'll go ahead and put in the 1550 red line uh, race oil. We'll go ahead and change out the diff fluid and then we should be ready to go. So right now again on this thing I got on Amazon. It's from Four Uncles, it says, but I'm gonna fill this up with brake fluid and then you turn it upside down 
stick it in your reservoir and uh, you either open the valve up or not and it kind of flows down in so you constantly have fluid going into your reservoir so you don't get an air bubble and then this little guy just kind of keeps it mounted uh, and screwed into the side there so but uh, it's nice to not have to keep pouring the bottle and pouring the bottle you can just come over here uh, crack the valve open real quick reclose it keep the reservoir filled up but uh, i got to get the air compressor out of the house real quick and then we'll go back here and we'll uh, go ahead and drain out the uh, first caliper and make sure we get the red line in. Now I just checked the factory fluid is very, very, very light and clear. Uh, this stuff is pretty much very light and clear also. So it's gonna be actually very difficult to tell when this actually gets through all the components and everything. So we're just gonna have to basically keep track that uh, this probably two bottles that we're gonna run through here uh, we'll probably do like maybe a quarter of the way or so uh, for you always want to go on the furthest away caliper first So the reservoir is up by the driver's side So we're gonna do the passenger rear driver rear and then passenger front and then driver front So once we get it all the way through the system going back the furthest distance Then it should be easy to not have to drain as much uh, for each uh, of the remaining. And I guarantee if we can get a bottle or two uh, through there, we'll have more than en enough of the race fluid throughout the entire system that uh, we'll know it be will be there because these colors, again, are actually very, very similar in color. There's no way to tell any difference. So unfortunately, we're just gonna have to go by a uh, measurement and maybe check the manual to see how much uh, the system actually does hold. And it looks like this little guy can get almost two bottles in. So from here on out, we just need to keep track and know what our measurement's actually going to be. Well, we can't get it down in there far enough because there is a little filter or something blocking me. And now with this bottle full of fluid, it definitely weighs a lot. So we may have to come up with something different or just hold this in our hand and uh, hold it over and let it trickle in and then close it again because there's probably way too much weight in here. So we'll just have to keep coming back around and keeping an eye on it. All right, so this bleeder is pretty easy. It comes with a quick connect hose that will obviously go on the nipple of the caliper. And then down in here, it's got like a quick connect that you just push on down, just like kind of like a, an air hose and it connects onto there. And then what we're gonna do, not only are we starting with the passenger rear, but we also wanna start out on the furthest side first. So you wanna go again the furthest away from where the reservoir is. So outside, then inside, then we'll go to the other side and we'll do outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside. And that's the way that you're supposed to do it. Hopefully this makes a super tight fit. Which it does, that's perfect. So we won't have to worry about any leaking going on. And then once we crack this open, this does have an automatic uh, that once you attach your air hose to, you can just leave this basically sucking the entire time or bleeding it out with this little clip right here. So once we attach the air hose, this thing will just be sucking away and uh, we'll probably just have to cut the feed off a little bit because when the air compressor kicks on, it's gonna be too loud. Or play some music, whatever. Little thoughts on that. Number one, you're gonna go deaf. Uh, the air compressor runs constantly because you basically have a wide open hole at the other end that all of that air bleeds out. And where the air bleeds out also makes you go deaf. It's very loud. But the compressor hung around 60 PSI 
and it says to be able to use that, its working pressure is 40 PSI up to like 140 PSI, so it's a pretty big difference uh, that you can run that thing up to a lot of pressure. It sucks out very fast, but not too fast at 60 PSI that you don't have to constantly be running back and forth, running back and forth and getting scared that uh, you may be doing something like sucking out too fast and not in time to fill it up. But uh, overall, that works pretty good. That's a hell of a lot faster just within maybe five minutes that caliper sucked out. And in fact, the entire reservoir was sucked out, refilled up, and then we switched to the inside and then sucked that out. So that was super awesome. Uh, it's the first time I've ever had a blader. Usually I do it manually by pumping the brakes and just kind of letting it feed out. Uh, the only other tidbit that I would say is I do not shut the air off with the bleeder still open. So let the entire system continue to run, lock your bleeder completely closed, then shut the air off. Because if you shut the air off prematurely and you don't have that bleeder locked and closed, then you could potentially get an air bubble to suck up through there because that white hose doesn't stay constantly filled with fluid in it. Like uh, what would normally happen when I do it. And I would just put a hose on the... Uh, on the caliper, let it drain down into like a bucket and I would pump the brakes and you can see it kind of go up and then back down if you arc it. Therefore, you don't have a chance to suck up an air bubble, but uh, this may be a little bit easier to do that. So go ahead and lock your bleeder down before you shut the air compressor or before you shut the bleeder system itself completely off. That is all four calipers, all eight bleeders completely done. We use two full bottles. Hopefully we got enough into each caliper because obviously the front are a heck of a lot bigger, but uh, I wish there was an easier way to tell and just how much each one went through because I don't know if uh, there's a distribution block somewhere. Like uh, if, for example, the distribution blocks like up here, then that means you'd have to suck a lot of fluid through each line going all the way back as opposed to if a line went to the back of the car and then teed off in the back and then they went to each rear caliper equally. So you'd be sucking it through the line and sucking it out of the reservoir. So I don't exactly know what that is, but I know we got two full bottles of Redline in. So at least the reservoir is 100% full. If there's a 50-50 mixture, let's say, in the front calipers because I didn't get it all out, well, we may experience a little bit of brake flade on the track until uh, we do this again. And then we 100% know that we'll get red line all the way through every single caliper and every single line. But uh, Saturday is just gonna be a kind of a test in tune day, first time out of the track in the car. So I'm not too worried about it. We're just feeling the car out and seeing how it's gonna shake out. And then uh, again, I think I'm gonna stop back here tonight or tomorrow night. Uh, put in the 1550 fluid uh, oil, change out the diff fluid for the red line 7590, and then I will see you guys back uh, Saturday morning when we're on our way up to the track. Well, we made it. It's Saturday morning. As you can tell from my attire, it's absolutely freezing, but it was raining at home when we left, so I would rather have it cold than rain. Uh, but that does concern me a little bit. This car takes forever for the transmission to heat up. The engine oil seems to heat up pretty dang quick, but the transmission takes forever and it shifts like crap until it is hot. And then we also have to worry about the tires. So we'll have to see how many laps it actually takes to get up the temperature to where it's not like squirrely and going everywhere. But I got a feeling that's going to be a problem no matter what. But luckily yesterday I was able to hit my 1500 miles, got the 1550 the race oil in, changed out the differential fluid, and uh, we already did the brakes and everything's good to go. The only thing that I did do was after I got home from hitting 1500 miles, I noticed the engine coolant was like beyond full. It was all the way up to the cap and there was no room for expansion and that was just under normal driving operating conditions. So I sucked a little bit out to get it back down to the max level because this thing's probably going to be 100 degrees hotter than it ever has coolant wise. So made no sense to have the coolant all the way at the all the way up to the cap with no room for expansion because it's going to expand. So took a little bit out of that and engine oil wise, the only thing I did was I did not change out the oil filter because I just didn't see a point. That first 500 miles that I did with a uh, filter change, that was going to catch all the debris that we would have anyway. So with uh, a, a new filter on for only a thousand miles, I'm not concerned that I need to catch some huge chunk of debris or that it's going to get released out into the system so um 
a little bit quicker and faster of an oil change anyway without having to do the filter but uh, everything else was pretty much as easy as you guys have seen before so we still have a little bit of time everyone's kind of getting here it's not even 8 a.m yet uh, i have registered but uh, we need to get it fired up go to tech inspection driver's meeting at 9 a.m and then the track is hot at 10 a.m so it'll be interesting to see. I think there's almost 30 people here. There's only 12 in the intermediate group. So it'll be, that's not that many people to be out on the track at once, but there was only five in the advance. So I probably should have signed up for the advance. That would have given me plenty of time to be away from everybody that I wouldn't have had to worry that I'm either too slow or just learning the car because we're so freaking spread out. But 12 isn't even that bad. Uh, I've been at Mid Ohio where I've seen intermediate groups. There's been like 20 or 30 people on the track at one time. So there's still plenty of room, I think, with 12. So it'll be interesting again, like I see. So hang tight. Uh, we'll be back when we're either in the meeting or after or when we actually get on track. So we're about to go out for our first uh, session. It's still only 40 degrees and I trailered the car here. So I think these cars are going to be a lot faster than me because I have no idea how long it's going to take to get the trans up to temperature, not to mention the tires. So uh, this first session is just probably going to be extremely slow and just getting heat into it. Hopefully by the next session, uh, the heat will remain in everything and I'll be able to get it up within like a lap or two. But I got a feeling it's going to be at least three or four laps before I get any heat into anything.
try and get heat into them. I just don't think I'm ever going to get up there. Right, third session out I didn't record the second because I was still trying to warm up but I should have because we actually went pretty fast ended up knocking 11 seconds off on the first session so getting pretty comfortable with the car um, this is my mom if you're noticing something different Erin setting this one out so she can get an experience in but she was able to make her way up and uh, go for a test drive so uh, hopefully this one goes well then the next time we'll get Aaron back in and then uh, we'll just keep on going and see what we can do. Car's handling good. I've got no complaints except for the paddle shifting. It actually isn't as great as the automatic, just letting the car do its own thing. But uh, I am kind of surprised at the oil temperature. We're only in the 60s today, but I'm seeing almost 270 degrees Fahrenheit on the oil temp. But uh, coolant and transmission and tires all look fabulous, but I am really surprised that the oil's getting that hot.
Well, while it's fresh in your head. Time of my life. I'm sure. Time of my life. It was. It was the time of my life. I loved it. I loved it. I'm getting a race car, guys. I'm getting a race car. Like it'll that? Be no, or? no, it'll be nothing like Scott's. It'll be like a little hot hatch. It'll be lighter. I would not be comfortable driving a car that heavy. Miata? No. Why? It won't be a Miata. Two door. I don't. Rear wheel drive. I don't. Lightweight. Light. It's not for me. Overall, the car handled, I really got no complaints. Um, I only had one fish tail. Uh, I was very smooth and easy on the throttle in and out of every corner. Um, it didn't seem to push, so no understeer, no oversteer. It was very neutral. The track alignment seemed well. The only thing I would complain about is just because the fact that it does seem so heavy, plus with her in it. Um, and again, probably not being too hard on the throttle. I could have definitely accelerated harder out of corners. Um, but it just, I mean, it feels like a tank. It feels like you're driving with us, a uh, 4,200 pound car. Um, but luckily I was able to pretty much pass everyone. Uh, I don't think I ever got some behind someone that I couldn't or that I came up on and I didn't pass them, but maybe I wasn't as fast. We timed some of the uh, advanced groups and I caught a couple like 117s. And luckily on our last event, I remembered that I had uh, Harry's lap timer re-downloaded it onto my new iPhone and uh, was able to get down into the 116s. Is that fast? Not really. I saw a couple guys on a forum that had like a top time list and uh, one guy had a lot of modifications and was like 110. Another guy had an upgraded supercharger and was like 112. And then I think third place was like 114. So I'm two seconds off from there, but again, first time out, kind of shaking down the car. I don't think I really could have pushed harder today with how I felt, but it's weird. The next time you come back, just like with my motorcycles, you may put down like a 124 at one time, and then the next time you're at like a 114. And then I upgraded suspension, and then I got down into like the 110s. So it's crazy how much time you'll drop if you give yourself kind of stepping away. And even I think on our first session, uh, we'll have to go back and review the footage, but I think I just kind of took note on the footage and saw like a 130. The second time we went out, I used the lap timer on the car. We were down to a 119. So just 11 seconds in between two sessions to kind of get your mind right and maybe pick a different line or kind of build up a little bit of courage. Um, it's crazy how much faster that you can actually get from just a session to session or from just another day with no modifications at all. Uh, it really does change things. So again, I've got no complaints. The only crazy thing is the engine oil again. I saw it get up to almost 275 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, oil really is not happy when it gets above like 260. 60. No clue if that gauge is accurate. Uh, most cars like to go into limp mode if they get above like 260, so that gauge may not be accurate uh, or else we should have felt pulling power. And it may not look fast on video, but holy crap, when you're hawking someone down on a straightaway, you're on them in a second. So there was no power cut or power loss. That thing flies. So I'm surprised it only has like 500 and something at the wheel. But again, some of the cars I was chasing down, uh, like this little Miata that kept going around with me, obviously, you know, it's like 180 horsepower. So quite a big difference from 650. But uh, yeah, I don't really have any complaints and uh, anything you felt or different or... I mean, there was a big difference from the first session to the second. And it just seemed like it was more just you, f you figured it out. Yeah, you just like, kind of go. You just kind of flipped a switch. Well, the first five laps too, I don't know how many were in the first session, but if let's say there was only like eight laps, the first five, I couldn't punch it. The, the transmission, I was kind of quickly hitting through my settings back between transmission and tire. Uh, I did see the transmission get up to about 120, which I think that's where the AMG said that you can punch it. So I started hitting a little bit more and then I flipped down and my tires are still reading cold. So I did not want to fishtail off track or anything like that. So I kept having the weight, kept having the weight until I'm like, ah, oh, normal operating temperature, go. And I am happy with some of the footage that you're seeing here right now. Uh, we definitely got some tire boogers all over the place, so we were definitely melting rubber. Uh, the outside edges are purple colored, so we were definitely transferring heat all the way. Uh, the wear looks even again with uh, Chevy's track alignment specs, so I guarantee they know what they're doing. 
And uh, I guess next time, if we come back here or Mid Ohio, where we've got some more crazy turns and elevation changes, we'll have to see what that actually feels like with the track alignment. So, did you talk about how aggressive it was once you let it shift on its own? Did oh yeah, the difference there. That that was probably I, did we? I think we did do that for the second uh, event. Um, the first event I was doing manual. The second I let the car do all the shifting holy crap in track mode in automatic that car will not shift until you're at red line in fact coming out of the back uh carousel kind of just slowly throttling on it'll hold 6,000 rpm and it will not shift until you give it a little bit more throttle and start to punch it then it will shift at 65 and it'll do it so very aggressive track mode in my opinion and uh just way better than what I could do. Um, me trying to figure out where my shift points are gonna be, or if down the front straightaway, I didn't want to redline it and I'd be in sixth gear, but then in like at one turn, I needed to be in second and I'm only down into like fourth. And I'm like, well, I obviously suck at this because you're trying to pay attention to multiple things. The car is just freaking fast and automatic and it shifts very well. Not as well, performance wise I would want to feel as the dual clutch in the AMG but racetrack wise in track mode I really don't have any complaints um, how it was shifting and holding gear I thought it was I thought it was good so we're gonna get on the highway here we got two and a half hours home so hopefully all the footage works out and I can edit it well enough for you guys to enjoy this and uh, my mom really enjoyed coming but my stepdad now is gonna hate uh, having to stay home and do some gardening he should have come but uh, until then, we'll see you guys next time. I uh, really hope you guys enjoy the video. Hit the thumbs up if you liked it. And uh, comment down below if you got anything to say. So until then, we will see you guys next time. Take care.